Hi, thank you all for being here today. My name is Nainika and my thesis is titled Gardens of Resistance. Before I start, I wanted to put forth my overarching research question as a precursor to my introduction. How can we spatialize the tools of resistance in the context of political urban capitals? In order to answer this question, we situate ourselves in New Delhi in India, a city that is the seat to the world's largest democracy today and one that has served as the nerve center of generations of empires and emperors, political paradigms and intersecting identities. As for most capital cities such as New Delhi, alongside entrenched political regimes comes the evolution of a parallel legacy of fighting against, of opposing and obstructing, and resisting. In zooming into the Central Vista capital complex in Lachin's New Delhi specifically, we look at a political urban fabric that has embodied these simultaneous histories for the past century as a site of power and of resistance to that same power as belonging to the governing and to the governed. Designed as the capital of the British Empire by Edwin Lutyens and Herbert Baker in the 20th century, the planned Central Vista complex was purposefully built in opposition to the city's historic Mughal center. In its scale, orientation, and location, it is seen to abide by the known tropes of imperial power, such as Houseman's Paris and Howard's Garden Cities. On the eve of Indian independence, the Central Vista and its buildings now stood as a symbol of the coming together of a nation against an oppressive colonial regime and this nation's new independent power. The British Empire's Council House was the site for India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru to deliver the infamous speech, India's Tryst with Destiny, marking shifts in ownership and occupation as British spaces were appropriated as post-colonial inversions. The years post-independence and thus post-partition of India and Pakistan were marked with large-scale migration and densification of Delhi's surroundings as the Indian polity dealt with the growing pains of independence. On the one hand, the site served as a space for engagement between the governed and governing in the form of protests, rallies, and parades, while on the other, it saw the burgeoning of icons of the metropolitan elite in the form of hotels and luxury residences. As said by historian Amita Bhavishkar, the building of planned Delhi was mirrored in the simultaneous mushrooming of unplanned Delhi. More recently, our site served as an interesting exemplar of the predicament in the rest of India today, as an attempted rebranding by the autocratic leadership aimed to eradicate public space to, through securitization and restriction, demolish old heritage buildings, and uproot luscious tree canopies without due process and dialogue. For India, the year 2020 marks a burgeoning of collective unrest against the powers in play as their identity politics and policies across the country have resulted in socio-religious turmoil, economic instability, and constant attacks on our civil liberties. Thus far, the site's spatial politics have witnessed a plethora of resistances. This thesis speculates on the evolution of such resistances, what they may continue to look like, and who they may be commanded by. Today, the playbook to resistance strategies being deployed in India and elsewhere looks something like this. Whether manifesting as the rallying cries at mass protests, as the purposeful strokes on canvas in practices of critical art, or as the defiant lyrics and rhythms in musical composition, the methods and means of resistance are instrumental in the vocabulary of any effective political vision. This leads us back to the original research question. How can we spatialize, both at an architectural and urban scale, the tools of resistance in the context of political urban capitals? To carry out my experiments in resistance specifically, I zoom in further within the larger complex to situate my site at Lachian's Mughal Gardens, the 15-acre backyard of India's polity, located behind what was initially the Viceroy's Palace, but today is Rashtrapati Bhavan or the President's Palace. The decision to do so looks to a range of effective precedents such as these, where the reconciliation of a traumatic, problematic past in Berlin, the resistance against an existing oppressive system in Washington, or the striving for an aware, inclusive future in Canberra all took place in visible city centers. Completed in 1930, the gardens of the presidential estate illustrate a once barren hilltop transformed into a lush landscape boasting 50 varieties of trees, 70 species of seasonal flora, 
jungles, orchards, and open grounds in just a few decades. It illustrates the coming together of an Islamic Persian charbagh and a formal English garden, an oasis of ecological diversity in the heart of one of the world's most dense, polluted cities. As far as Mughal gardens go, they have always been designed to serve as a microcosm of the rest of the empire at large, depicting the formal and symbolic tastes and desires of its creators. It is a typology whose lineage reflects constant experimentation and innovation, yet one that is always faithful to its experience and sentiment, whether cultural nostalgia or religious piety. While initially built as a landscape of imperial control and style, since independence, this first garden of the Republic was reshaped to serve in public service and diplomacy, often seen as the backdrop for award ceremonies celebrating prized citizens, as the site to host events for visiting heads of state, and as inclusive and accessible public space through the annual Garden Festival. The Lachian's Mughal Garden has always stood as a utopic site and symbol curated specifically to cultivate these socio-political relationships. As said by Baviskar, the English lawn in the Mughal Gardens seems made precisely for moments of these, tea, tact, and truce. This thesis questions the role of architecture in envisioning and engaging the tools of resistance in the context of such political sites. It narrates the stories of three actors as they reclaim the complex's Mughal gardens as spaces of their own resistance, at the intersection of the perspectives of relevant academics, artists, and aesthetics, and the architectural tools of process, scale, materiality, and temporality. The first experiment considers Gayatri Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? rethought in the context of contemporary India, yet still questioning how those excluded from dominant social hierarchies may express themselves. Simultaneously, we look to Hans Hauke's installation, translated to the population, calling for the participation of political leaders as they bring in soil from their home constituencies to compound in the German capital in the cultivation of a representative future. Our first set of actors are the Indian farmers, a contemporary interpretation of Spivak's exploited subaltern. In September 2020, three farm acts passed by the Parliament of India saw the coming together of what is being called the largest protest in human history, as millions took to the streets in opposition of these acts, elucidated as anti-farmer, leaving India's largest workforce of small farmers at the mercy of corporates. Although dawning as local protests, the movement soon burgeoned to be called the Lichello, or Let's Go to Delhi, where hundreds of thousands of farmers from neighboring states marched towards the nation's capital. On reaching the capital center, a constant deadlock between the government and the governing has resulted in an unrelenting sit-in. Whilst the city, state, and media focus on the commotion and bodies that have occupied the front line of the Central Vista, a newly acquainted group of 60 farmers from across the nation come together to take matters into their own hands. At nightfall, exactly four months, three weeks, and three days since the protests began, their resistance commences. Having heard of the famous Mughal Gardens, a utopia for masters of soil such as these, the farmers can think of no land that must be transformed and disrupted greater than this, the crown jewel of this repressive, tactless government. From nightfall until dawn, the farmers wreak havoc in the Lachian's sandstone straitjacket that they find, with nothing but their hands and the menial tools that they brought along with them. The orderliness of tidy, distinct beds of dahlias, tulips, and periwinkles are no longer, as they are all brought together in, into one coalesced layer of soil, seed, and species. The mastery of their craft, however, is illustrated in the kind of havoc that they wreak. Guided by the existing channels of water, as they would when first tending to a plot of fallow land, they divvy up the gardens into plot sizes similar to their own. Their muscle memory manifests into the methodical patterns of intercropping that they are used to. While each plot individually reflects the combination of crops that each farmer may be accustomed to grow, they come together in a garden labyrinthian typology, one that has existed in Indian spirituality for the past millennia as a space for engagement and participation as one with the spirit of theatricality and one with purposeful paths to attaining realization. 
While the morning after this laborious show of might and power illustrates acres of unearthed, tunneled, and borrowed soil, it is but expected that the well-kempt, pruned plants of Lachian's garden eventually grow into a visual treat different than what the site was used to. We witness the natural intermingling of smells, colors, and species into a new, reinvigorated landscape. While the labyrinth is both different and difficult to navigate, both physically and visually, it illustrates the sentiment and skill of the designers of this new landscape, as they come together to show how this group of the subaltern can actually speak. The second experiment sees the coming together of Arjun Apadurai's theories of the social imaginary and hope for democracy intersect with Safdar Hashmi's movement in Indian political street theater. Using city, and in this case capital center, as stage, we see the interacting of unusual actors and objects to mobilize and raise awareness through the creation of new, hopeful imaginations of engagement. On the eve of National Handloom Day this past June, the Indian Textile Ministry issued a quiet notification scrapping the decades-old All India Handloom and Handicraft boards. In a year when news cycles focused on the grueling effects of the pandemic and countless peaceful protests in the capital turned awry and violent at the hands of or in the presence of Delhi State Police, these headlines were dulled down to a soft murmur. At a time when the nation's Weavers were already facing grave economic crises. Women such as these no longer had a platform to liaise with the governing. From across the country, four different weavers began to make their way to the capital city. Despite having never left their hometowns and villages before, their feelings of helplessness overcame their reluctance. With bundles of textiles in tow, they began their respective journeys, hoping for an ambitious audience with someone who may address their grievances, afraid this was their only option. Upon reaching Lachian's capital complex, however, unsure what to do first, they instinctively followed the excited crowds headed towards the Mughal Gardens for the annual flower festival. Sensing an opportune moment to display some of their prized creations, the weavers followed suit. The countless glossy metal barricades, objects familiar from their overwhelming presence on the front pages this past year, seemed the obvious choice as tools to display their vibrant, virtuous crafts. As Apadurai's social imaginary kicks in, the women's hopeful imaginations of engagement sees the creation of new objects using existing barricades, an almost owed to the insurgent barricades of the French Revolution, ironically made entirely from found objects instead. Whether a colorful playscape for visiting school children, subverting the barricade's most recent histories, a traveling library weaving through the spaces of the capital, constantly evolving as authors, voices, and diverse perspectives are deposited, exchanged, and borrowed, a charpai, or a traditional Indian daybed to seek respite from the chaotic everyday, or repurposed by vendors to allow those that visit the Mughal Gardens to enjoy its fruit and flora in addition to those that occupy the insides of the monumental stone buildings. The third experiment brings together Felice Varini's anamorphic projections, a feat only possible with a thorough and comprehensive mastery of sight, with Shilpa Gupta's text-based art practice, using mundane everyday materials to shed light on silenced histories and dampened narratives. We turn our attention to our final set of actors, the gardeners or Malis of Lachian's Mughal Gardens. As hundreds of thousands of visitors explore the formal gardens every year, it is the quiet and unremitting work of the Malis that shape this verdant spectacle. What's more, is given the almost feudal system of employment in place since the gardens were built, it is the fathers and grandfathers of the current Malis who have also silently served in the cultivation and caretaking of this rich landscape. Despite generations of Malis feeding, adorning, and maintaining the most powerful spaces and individuals of the country, their standing within a lower caste has always upheld the sentiment of an outsider looking in. For one Mali specifically, the burgeoning cries of protests from the Central Vista, 
echoing through the hallways of Rashtrapati Bhavan, persuade him to accomplish an ephemeral yet purposeful resistance of his own. On his daily journey to decorate the state dining room with carefully arranged bouquets of roses and lilies, he discovers a vantage point, opportune to carry out his endeavor. Although the everyday routines of each Mali are carefully choreographed to the tune and watchful eye of commanding senior officials, this Mali's prowess and proficiency at his job allows for one calculated misstep almost every day. From the replanting of golden larkspur into dormant winter flower beds, to the peculiar yet purposeful pruning of the orange tree, the grinding and gentle scattering of turmeric from the president's garden. While each independent move may be subtle and unnoticeable amidst the otherwise overwhelming beauty of the garden, they piece together to form a powerful message to the insiders looking out of the sandstone towers. The patriotic lyrics of Hambi Dekinge by Fez Ahmad Fez, translated, We too shall bear witness, a subcontinental anthem against tyranny and oppression, is concealed by the iconic spectacles of Gandhi, the father of the nation. In conclusion, these stories speak to how a diverse set of actors strive to reinscribe criticality and imagination and provoke introspection through this otherwise charged landscape. They attempt forms of socio-spatial resistances in response to their own historical moments. And finally, I leave you with the irresistible words of Lebius Woods to ponder the methods and measures of your own resistances. Thank you so much for your time.